This week's episode is brought to you by Harry's. Now, I have always loved my Harry's razor. It's been with me for a very long while now, and it's been great. Well, I'm happy to say that the great has gotten even greater because they've come out with a new Generation 2 model that I love even more. It's got great feel, great balance. It's comfortable during the shave. It's comfortable after the shave. It's got a softer flex hinge for a more comfortable glide, a trimmer blade for hard-to-reach places, a lubricating strip, and a textured handle for more control when it's wet. And unlike the other guys, when Harry's upgrades their stuff, they keep the prices exactly the same. It's still just $2 for a blade instead of the $4 you'd pay in the store. It's a better shave for less money. Why on earth would I ever do anything else? Now, Harry's has also unveiled now an exciting new deal. To get you started, they have a special offer for listeners of the show. They are so confident in the quality of their blades that they will send you their popular free trial set, which comes with a razor, a five-blade cartridge, and shaving gel for free. This is all going to be free if you sign up for a shave plan, and all you have to do is pay the shipping, which is negligible. So when you're done with this episode, go to harrys.com and enter the promo code REVOLUTIONS to get started with your free trial set. But wait, there's more. When you enter Revolutions at checkout, they'll add a bottle of post-shave balm to your order for free. It's all can't miss. So go to harrys.com right now, enter the promo code REVOLUTIONS at checkout to claim your free trial set and post-shave balm. That's H-A-R-R-Y-S dot com and the promo code REVOLUTIONS. Hello, and welcome to Revolutions. Episode 5.16, Over the Mountains. We left off last time with Simon Bolivar convening the Congress of Angostura in February 1819 and setting it to work drafting a constitution for what they all called the Republic of Colombia, a republic that they claimed covered all of the old viceroyalty of New Granada. And for the moment, this was a laughably grandiose proclamation. The Republic, as such, was little more than a loosely knit-together collection of armies led by quarrelsome caudillos answering to a rickety chain of command with a headquarters tucked away deep in the Venezuelan interior. Caracas and the Venezuelan coast remained in royalist hands, and the entirety of New Granada continued to live under a restored viceregal regime that had been in place since General Pablo Murillo had arrived way back in 1816. But despite the apparent fantasy of it all, Simón Bolívar was about to audaciously bend reality to fit the fantasy. Gran Colombia would be a thing. Of that, for some reason, Bolívar was positive. Despite Bolívar's closing statement to the Congress that his work was done, one of the first things the Congress did was elect Bolívar president of the Republic. But everybody understood that he would focus almost exclusively on the war, and the actual business of civilian government would be left in the somewhat capable hands of a long-exiled New Granadan intellectual named Francisco Antonio Sea. Now, Sea is an interesting guy who's actually been around quite a bit, and he offers a different perspective on the events that we've covered so far. So, before we head back out to war with Bolivar, let's go back and do Francisco Antonio Sea. At 53 years old, Asaya was positively ancient compared to his fellow revolutionaries. Bolivar himself was still just 35, Santiago Mourinho was 31, Jose Antonio Paz was just 29, Santander was 27. Born in New Granada shortly after the revolt of the Comuneros, Asaya started in seminary, but his liberal curiosity got the better of him, and he moved to Bogota to study secular law. He emerged from university in 1789 as a professor of philosophy, but his liberal curiosity then landed him in big trouble. He was a member of that little enlightened social circle that surrounded Antonio Nariño, and when Nariño published the Declaration of the Rights of Man in 1794, Sea was amongst those arrested, and he was shipped off back to Spain, where he spent two years in the same Cadiz prison that would eventually swallow the bones of Francisco de Miranda 20 years later. Sea was paroled in 1796 and then pardoned in 1798, but the authorities barred him from returning to the Americas. So, trapped in Europe, Sea's curiosity then took him in a scientific direction, and he got himself appointed to a scientific mission to France in 1799. 
So arriving in France on the eve of Bonaparte's coup of Brumaire, say a witness firsthand the hopeful dawning of an enlightened end to the chaos of revolution, and he became an admirer of Bonaparte and a confirmed Francophile, seeing in the French the polar opposite of the medieval ignorance of the Spanish. He finally returned to Spain in 1803, and now a somewhat renowned scientist and intellectual, Say was appointed head of the Royal Botanical Garden in Madrid. But his French connections and worldview were very strong now, and when the abdications of Bayonne hit in 1808, Say was one of the 85 deputies selected by Napoleon to rubber stamp the transfer of power to Joseph Bonaparte. Say was then rewarded with a provincial governorship, and he loyally served the French regime until the end. So through the whole of the Peninsular War, Sayo was on the other side. When Napoleon's empire started imploding in 1814, Sea fled back to France. Instead of remaining in Europe, though, for the final collapse of Imperial France, Sea decided it was time to return home after 20 years of exile. Now, I lose track of him for a little bit, and I'm not sure where exactly he landed, but the next time I can nail him down is 1816, when he shows up in Haiti to join Bolivar's little band of revolutionary caudillos who were gathering under the patronage of Alexandre Pétion. So Sea was amongst those who traveled back with everybody to Venezuela in March of 1816. But Sea was an intellectual, not a soldier. So though he was respected, he was not exactly a force to be reckoned with in a company where the number of scars you had counted for more than the number of books you had read. But he was also something of an acceptable neutral party between all the caudillos. And after Bolivar had been sent back into exile following his disaster at Acumare, Sea was the one who made the trip back to Haiti at the end of 1816 to tell the liberator, come back, we actually do still need you. After Bolivar and company successfully captured Angostura in the summer of 1817, Sayo was then dispatched on a mission to London to assist the recruitment of British legionaries, and so he was amongst those running around painting happy little trees for would-be recruits. But then rumors started filtering back home that Sayo was overstepping his bounds, taking out unauthorized loans and possibly embezzling money, so Bolivar recalled him to Angostura. But obviously there were no hard feelings, because upon his return, Bolivar made Sea editor-in-chief of a new patriotic newspaper that had been started to promote the Republic. And that was the job that Sea held until his election to vice president of the Republic in February 1819, which, as it would turn out, was an office worth quite a bit more than a bucket of warm spit. Because when Bolivar rode off to resume his grand war of liberation, Sea became the de facto president of the Republic. But though there was something pleasantly respectable about a civilian running the government, it would not be long before the Caudillos, who even Bolivar had trouble keeping in line, would begin looking sideways at the bookworm in Angostura telling them how to do their jobs. Especially once the rumors started filtering back that Simone Bolivar was dead. After issuing some final instructions to the eastern Caudillos, Mourinho and Bermudez and those guys, Bolivar gathered up a company of about 300 newly arrived British legionaries and headed west up the Orinoco River in the direction of the Western Janos and the army of Jose Antonio Paz. Now, the relationship between Paz and Bolivar was critical to the success of the revolution, but that relationship was complicated. Paz was simultaneously deferential and insubordinate. He continued to act like Bolivar's orders were mere recommendations to be taken under advisement, but he did not budge from his belief that Bolivar was the right man to be El Jefe Supremo. So, for example, in the summer of 1818, after Bolivar had returned to Angostura following his disastrous attempt to take Caracas, that was all the stuff we talked about last time, elements in Paz's command, most especially a few of the newly arrived British officers, tried to orchestrate a coup to make Paz El Jefe Supremo, and send Bolivar to his fifth and hopefully final exile. But Paz wouldn't have it, and at Bolivar's order, he tossed the principal British agitator in jail and then deported him from the country. So though Paz took Bolivar's orders under advisement, he did follow them when he agreed with the orders. And after departing for Angostura, Bolivar ordered the Lion of the Apure to avoid any major battles with General Murillo's royalist army until Bolivar came back, and Paz complied. He followed this order even as Murillo marched on Paz's headquarters in the city of San Fernando. Refusing to fight, but also refusing to let Murillo take the city, 
Paz ordered San Fernando burned to the ground and then withdrew with his men out into the open plains. Murillo later said that when he saw the flames rising from San Fernando, he pretty much lost all hope of ever winning the war. How do you fight an enemy that simply does not care about living naked out in the wilderness if they have to? Paz then continued to avoid any set engagements while harassing Murillo mercilessly with guerrilla attacks. And the only thing Murillo really has going for him here is that he was a veteran of the Peninsular War, and so he was well acquainted with guerrilla tactics, and he had some idea how to deflect them. He kept his men together, he prevented anyone from getting isolated, he maintained strong defensible positions and tried not to take any obvious bait, but it was hard, and it was demoralizing, and it was exhausting. And General Murillo's request to be relieved continued apace. So though things were going according to his instructions, when Bolivar reached Paz's headquarters finally in March of 1819, his first question was, where do you and your men stand? Are you with me or what? Paz said, yes, we are with you. Nothing has changed. Okay, good. Let's get back to it. So reported troop strength numbers fluctuate a lot depending on the source you read, but combined, Bolivar and Paz currently led somewhere between three and 4,000 men. And though they would ultimately disagree about where this year's campaign was headed, they once again agreed that attacking General Murillo was the obvious opening move. And at the moment, Murillo was headquartered at a spot called La Caceres del Medio. And again, numbers are difficult to establish, and in total Murillo commanded somewhere between six and 7,000 men, but how many were actually there with him is unclear to me. In fact, picking through the details of what happened next has been pretty tricky in general because accounts differ and provide different significant details. But it's a pretty big moment in the wars, so I'm pretty sure that this is how things unfolded. On April the 2nd, 1819, Bolivar granted Paz permission to launch an attack on Murillo's forces. But the ever-daring Paz only rode off with 150 men. One, five, zero. Oh. He broke his men up into small squadrons to ride around kicking up dust to make sure it seemed like the whole Republican army was on the move. Now, Murillo was probably tricked into thinking that more than just 150 men were on the way, but he was by now fully aware of Paz's standard hit-and-run tactics, and so Murillo was at least prepared for that when it came. And in fact, he laid a pretty careful trap. When the dust clouds were reported, Murillo mobilized about a thousand cavalrymen and arrayed them at the far wings of his army, with the infantry and heavy guns in the center. When Paz's generos charged in for the hit, Murillo launched his own cavalry on a diagonal line to cut off the run. So this started out according to plan for both sides. Paz came charging in for the hit and then turned around for the run, but now an overwhelming cavalry force was threatening to close off their escape. So Paz ordered one of his best officers, a guy named Juan Jose Rondon, to wheel around with a small company and charge headlong back into the center of the Royalist infantry. And this had the intended effect. The Royalist cavalry wings took the bait and collapsed in on Rondon's little band, while Paz and the rest of his generos were able to keep riding away. But just before he was fully enveloped, Rondon and his men broke off their attack, wheeled around again, and then burst through the last little sliver of daylight. With the Royalist cavalry now ramming into each other and the infantry, everything in their lines devolved into a tangled mess of confusion. When Paz saw all the disarray, he gave the most famous order of his career. Now, the official sanitized version is that he yelled, Vuelven caras, or about face. But historians think it far more likely that he yelled, Vuelven carajo, which has a few literal ways it can be translated, but my Spanish-speaking friends on Twitter think I can go with, Go back, goddammit. And yes, you can come find me on Twitter at Mike Duncan. It's actually way easier to get a hold of me there than by email. Anyway, after yelling, Go back, goddammit, All 150 of his men wheeled around and charged headlong back into the disorganized mess of royalists. With confusion reigning and believing that they were well and truly under attack by the whole Republican army, the royalists all panicked. The cavalry just rode off, leaving the infantry to fend for themselves, and understandably spooked, the infantry then broke and fled in all directions, just trying to get out of this alive. When the dust finally cleared, upwards of 500 Spaniards lay dead, 
and all their heavy artillery pieces were just sitting around waiting to be picked up. Having beaten a force that was at a minimum ten times larger than his own, the Lion of the Apure lost two dead and six wounded. In the aftermath of the battle, General Murillo sent back a report stating that he had been attacked by at least 700 men, and it's not clear whether he believed that or was exaggerating to cover his butt, as generals throughout history have been wont to do. The two sides then spent the rest of April and May 1819 waging an indecisive war of skirmishes. Bolivar desperately wanted to deliver one more decisive blow before moving on, but Murillo wasn't having it, and he refused to be baited into a battle. This was frustrating, because the rainy season was starting to set in, and Bolivar couldn't afford to wait much longer to execute the plan that he had been keeping secret for months, a surprise invasion of New Granada. But the final piece of that secret plan finally fell into place at the end of May, when he got a letter from Francisco de Paula Santander, and Bolivar knew it was time to move on. So backing up a little bit, after Bolivar and Paz and Santander had gone their separate ways in the summer of 1818, with Bolivar going back to Angostura and Paz staying in the Venezuelan Llanos, Santander had crossed back over into New Granada to recruit men and most especially gather intelligence on the state of affairs and whether New Granada could even be taken by an invasion. After nine months of work, Santander finally wrote back to Bolivar to say, yes, New Granada is ripe for the plucking come on over. And though Santander is not exactly an unbiased observer, I mean, he wants Bolivar to invade New Granada, he wasn't wrong. Remember, General Murillo had brought most of his own army back into Venezuela, leaving behind a small corps of peninsular soldiers to manage things with the help of some local militia. Santander was able to report that these forces were not exactly crack units. They were underpaid, undersupplied, and very low on morale. And then just in general, the viceroy that Murillo had reinstalled in Bogota believed that harsh repression was the most effective means to bring the country back into line. Murillo counseled ruling with a lighter hand, but the viceroy wanted no part of it, and Bogota had become a repressive hub of summary executions, property confiscation, and just general maltreatment of the locals. Whether they were diehard patriots or not, the people of New Granada did not like the new viceregal regime. All of this, Santander jubilantly reported to Bolivar. So Bolivar now made his move. On May the 23rd, 1819, he called his senior officers for a small council of war in the town of Setenta. There, using cattle skulls for chairs, Bolivar revealed his plan. They would march across the Janos, up into the mountains of New Granada, surprise the royalists, and seize Bogota. Now, this is Bolivar at his most recklessly daring. Remember, this is the beginning of the wintry, rainy season, and already the Janos was filling with water from rains that never ceased. The mountains would be more of the same, except everything would be freezing cold to boot. Now was the time to retire for the winter, not literally march into some of the steepest mountains in the world. But Bolivar believed that it could be done, and more importantly, if it were done, it would be a strategic masterstroke. Now, his plan was inspired both by the recent example of José de San Martín, who had just liberated Chile with his own surprise invasion through the Andes, and also by the most famous general in history, because it goes without saying that Bolívar was well-versed in the life and career of Hannibal. And if you guys remember from back in the history of Rome, Hannibal always preferred difficult terrain to the fortunes of a battle not of his choosing. His own march through the Alps in terrible weather is legendary, But even more impressive was that time he marched three days through a supposedly impenetrable swamp to split the legions and surprise the Romans at their rear. That was when he lost his eye. Taking an army into the mountains now was brilliant because it was insane. General Murillo suspected Bolivar's ultimate intention was to invade New Granada, but there was plenty of time to prepare for that because it's not like they were going to leave tomorrow. And as for the royalist forces in New Granada... Well, it quite rightly did not even occur to them that an invasion might be coming from Venezuela, which was Bolivar's point. His officers agreed that it was crazy, but doable. The only dissenter to all this was Paz, which drove Bolivar crazy, because Paz had actually been the first man Bolivar had confided his plans to, and he seemed at the time to have been in full agreement. 
But now that it was actually before him, the centaur of the plains did not want to leave the plains. And you can't really blame him. Half-naked cowboys who ride around in grasslands are not exactly well-suited for frozen, steep, mountainous terrain. But though furious at the perceived betrayal, Bolivar once again recognized that he could not risk losing a staring contest to Paz. So Bolivar compromised. He ordered Paz to take up a position at Cucuta, which was still on the other side of the border in New Granada, and still off the Janos. But rather than participating in the full invasion, Paz would watch the rear and make sure that Murillo did not follow. To this, Paz agreed. And he also further agreed to let some of his men go with Bolivar, including the hero of La Caceres del Medio, Juan José Rondon. But even with this compromise in place, Paz still continued to take Bolivar's orders under mere advisement. And after Bolivar rode away, Paz turned around and headed east. He never would go to Cucuta. On May the 26th, 1819, Bolivar set out with 2,100 men, divided into four infantry battalions and three cavalry squadrons. Also in the mix were various non-combatant auxiliaries, including families of some of the men, especially from among the 300 or so British legionaries, who, as I said, had signed up for service in South America as much to try to start a new life there as to go on some grand military adventure. And one of the women present was, I kid you not, nine months pregnant. I don't know her name, but we'll get to her in a second. Now, no one was told what the ultimate destination was going to be because Bolivar quite rightly feared mass desertion. Now, before they could even begin the grueling march up into the mountains, they had to get to the mountains. So Bolivar pointed them in the direction of Tame, on the other side of the border in New Granada, where Santander was waiting with his own small army. But Tame was over 250 miles away, and by now the rains were nonstop and torrential. As I mentioned a few times, during the dry season, the Janos is bone dry, but during the rainy season, everything floods. So this is not a time to go out marching, but the only way to get from here to there was to march from here to there. In the best of conditions, this meant slogging through thick mud that enveloped their feet and their carts and their horses and their animals. Worse conditions meant wading through standing water up to their knees and then up to their waists. The worst conditions meant literally swimming alongside improvised leather boats that held their gear. And always it rained, and always there were bugs. Animals died, supplies, guns, and carts were abandoned if they became immovable. And even if this all hadn't ended with a march through the mountains, this march through the wintry Janos rain would have been impressive all on its own. Just before the army crossed the border into New Granada, Bolivar finally revealed to his men what this was all about, that this was in fact the beginning of the invasion of New Granada. And by this point, the only way out was forward. Finally, in the last week of June, the beleaguered army hit dry ground as the grasslands gave way to the foothills at the base of the mountains, and they successfully linked with Santander's forces at Tame. The men were given a week to recuperate from their long march through the flooded plains, but on July the 1st, 1819, it was back to it, and now the going was going to get really tough. The small army traveled west as the crow flies, but mostly they went up, 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 up. The rains never stopped, except now instead of mud and flood water, it was all slick rocks and iced over paths that ran along narrow ravines. And it's not like these guys had gone to REI to get outfitted for the ascent. They were poor peasant soldiers. These guys were marching barefoot. They marched in tattered rags that could only charitably be called a uniform. As they struggled up the mountain, the strong started to carry the weak, and Bolivar personally carried men broken from whatever combination of hunger and fatigue, sickness, or injury had taken them down. Many just didn't make it. They dropped dead, and everyone else just kept walking. Up, 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 because you can't go back now. They would hit torrential creeks raging from winter rain and have to cross in a single file line with each person holding the hand of the man in front of them and behind them forming a human chain until they all reached the other side. They would reach chasms that could only be crossed by stringing a rope between the trees and fixing improvised leather hammocks to take men and women across one by one. 
and eventually they crested 13,000 feet as they wound their way around the tallest peaks. Hypothermia set in, and even if you wanted to stop, you couldn't because you would just freeze to death. On July the 3rd, on the third day of the climb, that pregnant woman I mentioned, she gave birth. Now, as the father of two small children, I've just been through all of this, and frankly, I consider the woman's presence on the march to be insane already. But then on top of that insanity, right now, in the middle of all this, she gives birth. The next day, Bolivar spotted her with the newborn strapped to her chest under a blanket as she just kept walking. Now, I have no idea what happened to her because after this, she just disappears from the record. But I have to say, of everything I've talked about over the whole course of this show, all of it, everyone, this unnamed woman giving birth in the middle of this deadly, treacherous hike, it might be the single most badass moment I've ever heard of. I mean, my God, this isn't something I'm making up. This actually happened. On July the 6th, after six days of marching, the bedraggled little army finally hit a safe oasis the town of Suacha, about 150 miles northeast of Bogota. The residents there had been alerted that this liberating army was doing this insane thing and rushed out to their aid. They brought food and blankets and water and gave them fire, literally the essentials of life, to save these men and women who had done this crazy, reckless, brave thing. But there was one upside to all this. The Royalist forces had no idea that they were there. They had no garrisons even remotely close and no prearranged plan for how to deal with an invasion right now in all this crappy weather in July 1819. Bolivar's men were all half dead, but to a certain degree, they had the enemy right where they wanted them. Now, as he himself struggled up the mountains, Francisco de Paula Santander was able to observe Bolivar's relentless energy, his courage, and genuine compassion for the men who were following him. Now, as with Paz, Bolivar and Santander had a complicated relationship, and for example, Santander had never gotten over that time Bolivar threatened to shoot him right at the beginning of the admirable campaign six years earlier. But here, Santander was blown away by Bolivar's resolve, his determination, and his genuine spirit of patriotic unity. I mean, all that talk of everyone being in this together was one thing when Bolivar was trying to convince New Granadans to come help him liberate his home country of Venezuela. But now Bolivar was showing the same relentless resolve the other way. He was leading Venezuelans to liberate New Granada. And Bolivar then wasted no time making sure that their shared sacrifice was not all in vain. He immediately began planning the next stage of the campaign, and Santander later said, Here is where this man distinguishes himself above the rest, exhibiting extraordinary resolve and energy. In three days, he remounts and arms the cavalry, musters ammunition, reassembles the army, then sends out patrols, energizes the citizens, and plans an all-out attack. Now, even though Santander and Bolivar would spend as much time in conflict with each other as in partnership, at this moment, Santander came to realize that whatever else he thought about Bolivar— Bolivar's shtick was not empty vanity. He was the real deal. By now, word was spreading that this Republican army had appeared out of nowhere, and the ranking Spanish general, a guy named José María Barrero, quickly mustered what forces he could, ultimately about 4,000 men, to put them between Bolivar's army and Bogotá. Now, after the dead were subtracted and new recruits added, Bolivar was now leading an army of about 2,600 men, and near the end of July, they were on the move towards Bogota. On July the 25th, they finally ran into the Royalists at Pantano de Vargas, literally the Vargas Swamp, a region of swampy marshes rimmed by low hills. And General Barrera was able to occupy those hills with his Royalist forces, which gave him two essential advantages. He both outnumbered Bolivar and held the high ground. And this is usually game, set, match. But Bolivar, of course, decided to launch a full frontal assault right into the teeth of this. When things, quite predictably, started going badly for the Republicans, their left flank was being turned in disarray, the British legionary stepped into the breach and held back any finishing blow, which gave just enough time for Juan José Rondón, the hero of La Quesadas del Medio, to lead the cavalry on a furious charge up into the high ground, wielding nothing but spears and machetes. They crashed into the shocked Royalist line just as heavy rains started to fall. 
The Royalist soldiers had been preparing for a long winter of sitting around doing nothing. Not, you know, standing here in the rain being attacked by machete-wielding crazy people from Venezuela. They completely caved, broke, and fled. Santander later reported that the Battle of Pantano de Vargas had been won by the calm of the British and the intensity of the Generos. In the aftermath of his defeat at the Vargas Swamp, though, the Royalist General Barrario made a critical decision. He decided to lie his head off to the Viceroy about the battle. He sent a dispatch assuring the Viceroy that the Republicans had been beaten soundly and that everything was well in hand. Now, what I'm guessing here is that Barrario did this for two reasons. First, he did not want to provoke a panic in Bogota that might trigger a patriotic insurrection. And second, he wanted to buy himself some time to regroup, catch Bolivar, and deliver the crushing blow he now already claimed had been delivered. But that's not how things are going to go. Instead, this lie would set the stage for the decisive battle of the campaign, the battle that to this very day marks the beginning of true independence for Colombia, the Battle of Boyacá. On August the 7th, 1819, the two sides were maneuvering around Tunja, once capital of the now defunct Union of New Granada. Bolivar's forces still numbered about 2,600, Barrio's about 2,800. But as the Royalists moved around Tunja, trying to get onto the main road back to Bogota, they split in two, with an advance guard approaching a key bridge over the Boyacá River and a rear guard about a mile behind them. Now, Bolivar had posted a small cavalry unit near the bridge to keep an eye on things, and when this advance guard approached and saw that little unit, they thought it was the only small unit in the area. But Bolivar's entire army was just behind a hill out of sight. So these two little cavalry units skirmished against each other, but when the Republican forces fell back, they fell back not out of sight, but into the waiting embrace of a much larger force led by Santander. The Royalist vanguard realized they had made a mistake that a much larger army was right around the corner, but then they made another mistake. Rather than racing back to reunite with the rear of the army, they raced forward to capture the Boyacá Bridge. Now, this seemed like a good idea at the time, hold the critical bridge, but it split the Royalist army in two, and the force led by Santander was hot on their heels, And so, yes, they took the bridge and got to the other side, but now they were pinned down there and cut off from their comrades. Meanwhile, the rest of Bolivar's army came pouring out around the hill. They located the Royalist rear guard strung out along the road and hit them from all sides. Bolivar ordered the British legionaries to attack the front of the Royalists. Rondon and the Generos rode around the back and hit them from the rear. And then Bolivar ordered everyone else on a bayonet charge right into their center. General Barrio's forces were hit from three sides simultaneously by a surprise attack. All told, the Battle of Boyacá lasted no more than two hours, and it was a complete Republican victory. General Barrio himself was cornered and captured, as were 1,600 of his men. Another 500 lay dead, and the rest just scattered. There was now quite literally no Royalist army within 500 miles of Bogotá, The question now was not whether the Republicans would take the capital, but whether they would capture the Viceroy in the process. They nearly did capture the Viceroy, but about 50 of the men who had been pinned down by Santander at the bridge managed to get away. They raced for Bogota to raise the alarm. Now, the city had no idea anything was even remotely amiss. The Viceroy was in fact sitting around having dinner when a messenger burst in and told him the enemy was victorious and nothing was standing between them and Bogota. After getting over his shock, the Viceroy had no time to do anything but just run. His attendants dressed him up like a peasant and he snuck out of town. Bolivar would later send agents out looking for him, but the Viceroy was never located. And he never stopped running either. He wound up making it all the way to Cartagena and then he immediately got on a ship and sailed back to Spain, never to return. Meanwhile, Bolivar was on a race of his own. With the smoke at Boyacá barely cleared, he was off like a shot at full gallop to close the hundred miles or so to Bogotá. And when he arrived in the city, he found himself greeted by bewildered citizens. I mean, less than 12 hours ago, they had been under the impression that whatever small invading force that had come up through the mountains had been beaten. And that was if they knew anything about any of this at all. 
And instead, what? General Bolivar is here and he's won? The Viceroy is gone? And then Bolivar discovered just how close he had come to capturing the Viceroy. There were literally still bags of money on his desk just left behind in the rush. The treasury was full. The munitions depot were stocked. This was a complete victory on all fronts. But Bolivar had been in the dark himself about a lot of what had gone on in New Granada. And when he greeted men that he had known from the last time he had passed through Bogota in 1815, he asked around for the others. Where's President Camilo Torres, the man who supported me in my darkest hours? He was dead. His head had been chopped off and posted on a spike. Oh, what about this guy? What about that guy? They had all been killed in the aftermath of Murillo's reconquest. It was a sobering back end to an otherwise jubilant moment. Now, since we know how this all turns out, we know that the Battle of Boyacá marks the beginning of Colombian independence, real permanent independence. There was no guarantee at the time that it would, nor any way that anyone could have known that it would, but it did. Bolivar's dramatic push into New Granada had fundamentally altered the political and geographic axis of the war. The Republicans were no longer confined to a few interior bases hiding out in Angostura, playing Congress. They now controlled a huge stretch of territory reaching from the Orinoco River to Bogota, and in no time, they would bring all of the interior of New Granada under Republican jurisdiction. It was now the Royalists who were confined, restricted to a few ports along the coast, short of men, and now knocked thoroughly back on their heels. When General Murillo was briefed about what had happened, he wrote a report to the Ministry of War back in Spain and said, The rebellious Bolivar has occupied the capital of Bogota, and the deadly outcome of this battle gives him dominion over the enormous resources of a highly populated, abundantly rich nation, from which he will take whatever he needs to prolong the war. This unfortunate loss delivers into rebel hands, apart from the kingdom of New Granada, many ports in the south where he will now deploy his pirates. The interior of the continent all the way to Peru is at the mercy of whoever rules in Bogota. In just one day, Bolivar has undone all that we have accomplished in five years of this campaign, and in one single battle, he has reconquered all the territory that soldiers of the king have won in the course of so many past conflagrations. Bolivar then set up shop in the great capital of Bogota and began putting together the bare bones of a new government to rule New Granada. But it was never his destiny to be a man of laws, and he was itching to get back on his horse to ride triumphantly through liberated New Granada, spreading the good news that they were all free, and most especially to return to Venezuela to trumpet the success of the invasion, and then return to Angostura to make preparations for the true union of Venezuela and New Granada, to no longer hide on the Orinoco River, but to meet out in the open and in full dignity. So at the end of September 1819, he appointed Santander, the man who was destined to be the man of laws, vice president of New Granada, and left him the difficult task of organizing a restored republic. And this was truly a job for Santander, always a mediocre soldier at best, who did not fit in easily with the rough men who had been so easily won over by Bolivar. Santander was completely in his element, seated behind a desk drawing up edicts and reforms and tax codes and an entire political apparatus. And that is where Santander would stay, becoming the founder of modern Colombia, as Bolivar himself left the capital in September 1819. Next week, the Liberator will return to Venezuela to forge the Union of Gran Colombia. But he would discover that in his absence from Venezuela, the tenuous alliances that had held the eastern Caudillos together had broken apart, and it would take careful cajoling and careful soothing to bring everyone back together to complete Bolivar's first and most compelling desire to liberate Venezuela once and for all. Mm-hmm. 